And if you can go with me to Ephesians 6, 18 in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, you can always use your phone. You've got Bible apps there. Ephesians 6, 18. And it says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. And Father, I just thank you again for tonight's service. I pray, Lord, that you would speak. May our ears be open to hear what you want to speak to us, God. May the words that I speak only be words that you've given me to speak through the power of your Holy Spirit. And I thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can take a seat. So I know some of you guys know me, um, but you may not know this about me, that I have actually traveled quite a bit around the world um, doing missions, trips, and different things like that. I've gone to the Philippines. I've been to Guatemala. I have been to India about five times. Um, and I've been a bunch of different layovers in France and Germany and all kinds of different places um, and had a lot of really cool experiences, seen a lot of really crazy stuff. Um, but I've also seen God move really powerfully as well. And um, on one of my trips to India a few years ago, I want to share with you a little bit of a story that I experienced there. And I got to India, and I was kind of praying, and like, God, like, use me. Like, I, I want, to, want to touch somebody's life or, or something. Like, use me on this trip um, in a special way, because sometimes you go, and you're part of trips, and you do a lot of really cool stuff, and you see a lot of crazy things, but... Sometimes you really want God to, like, just do something with you, like, with somebody. And so one of the nights I, I had a dream, and it was kind of a two-part dream. One of the dreams was we were there for a conference, and the pastors were there, and, and we were doing worship and stuff. So it kind of had a part to do with that dream. And then all of a sudden, I had this vision dream of this girl. And this girl was, like, running for her life, and she was running through the streets, and it was like she was being chased and she's like running out of breath. She's running for her life through the streets of India. And she finds this house and she goes inside and she's hiding like in this closet. And no one's there, but she's hiding. And these people were chasing her. And all of a the sudden, they, she's like cornered up in the corner and she's like trying to be quiet. And they find her. And they grab her and they took her. And she's just screaming and screaming. And I could hear it like I woke up with that like scream in my spirit of this girl just like piercing, piercing scream. And I wake up and I was like, wow, like, God, like, why are you giving me this dream? Like, what's the purpose? So I go to the pastor and I kind of shared with him what had happened. I said, listen, I had this dream, this part first, and then this part with this girl. And he's like, okay, well, that's awesome. Like, thank you for sharing that with me. I want to pray over that and stuff. And then, like, the next day he calls me over. He's like, hey, come here. The service had finished and he was there with this lady. He's like, hey. Um, this mom just came to me, and she's crying out of fear for her daughter's life. And I want you to pray for her, because that's the girl in your dream. And nothing had happened, but the mother was so fearful that something, she just felt something wasn't right, something dangerous was going to happen. And he's like, pray over her. And I prayed over that girl, and I prayed over the mom, and I prayed over her safety. And I believe to this day that that girl is safe because of that prayer. I believe to this day that that girl is okay and her family is okay because of that prayer. And sometimes we think, oh, well, nothing crazy happened, so, you know, that's cool. If you prayed or didn't pray. No, I believe that she is saved only because of that prayer, because God speaks. And because of my journey through those different things, a few weeks back, um, we were doing a series here at the church on prayer, the Lord's Prayer specifically. And every single week we're talking about different Bible um, the Bible verse where it's found in Matthew 6. Um, and I'm going to recap that just super quick for you guys. Matthew 6, 5 through 13. And every week we talked about a different um, line of the Lord's prayer. So Jesus is teaching in this prayer, just to recap for those maybe if you weren't here or weren't a part of that um, message, that Jesus is teaching the disciples and teaching the people about prayer and how to pray. And he's talking about how don't go... Um, be like the Pharisees who are hypocrites. They basically go and they stand and they pray. And so they look holy. They look worthy. Like they've, oh, I got this together. Like I'm going to pray in front of people. So they can see and Jesus is teaching them, don't be like that. Don't be like the Pharisees and pray in a way. He says, no, go, go into your room, close the door and pray to me, pray to your father. And then he proceeds to tell the Lord's prayer. If you don't know, it is 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, for yours is the kingdom and power and the glory forever. Amen. That's another recap of what that is. So I want to go into that a little bit with you guys tonight, because this prayer is such a foundation in our relationship with Jesus. It's such a foundation in who we are as a Christian. And I want to go and outline that a little bit for you. And so this passage that we read, it's a pretty simple prayer, right? And I believe that Jesus made it to be just that, simple. Sometimes I think we think of prayer and it's got to be like this, I got to pray all these things and I got to have the right words to say and and I've got to pray for this person and that person and all this stuff that's going on in the world and all these different things that we think we have to have these eloquent words. And Jesus really said that very short phrase and said, pray like this. And sometimes I think we, even as Christians, almost take that out of context and we're like, yeah, I'll pray that, but I got to pray all these other things too. That's not what the Bible even says. And that's not what Jesus taught. So if it's really that simple, what's the problem that we have? Why is prayer sometimes like the least exciting thing in church? Why is prayer sometimes the thing that we least want to wake up and join the call for? Trust me, I've been there. Um, Why is prayer sometimes difficult for us to do, but yet we can stay up all night talking to our friends, but we can barely stay awake for five minutes? The devil knows the power of prayer, and he's going to do whatever it takes to stop you from praying because there's power in your prayers. I'll say that again. There is power in your prayer. How many believe that there's power in your prayers? Raise your hand. Right? All right? You can put your hands down. How many of you this week have prayed, but not only prayed, You've prayed believing that there's actual power in what you're praying for. A lot less hands. That's interesting, right? And I believe that's the devil's exact plan. A lot of times we don't pray like we should because we pray safe prayers. We pray prayers like, God, guide, guide me, keep me safe, keep me healthy. And those are all good prayers to pray. Don't get me wrong. Those are great prayers to pray. But those are promises that God already promised in the word of God for us. We're just asking to pray those things again. We're praying for them again. But God already promised those things. And some of us don't pray bold prayers, powerful prayers. Following Jesus isn't supposed to be safe. I don't know about you, but following Jesus isn't supposed to be safe and just pray safe prayers know us to pray those powerful prayers, those bold prayers like, God, use me. And when you ask God to use you, maybe he'll give you a crazy dream about somebody and then have you go and pray for them. And you better believe that that prayer should hopefully, I believe that in the power of your prayer, will be true. It's also possible that a lot of us don't like prayer because we haven't truly experienced the God that we're praying to. It's difficult to have a long conversation with somebody that you don't really connect with, right? I don't really connect with you. I'm kind of done with this conversation. It's also easy to get super distracted by all of the voices that we have, right? Phones, TV, Netflix shows or series that we're trying to catch up on. There's a lot of things that we get distracted by, and we really miss the most important voice of them all. Some of you right now, you might have already tuned out to the message a little bit, because the topic alone is not really that exciting, not that edgy, and it's, it's not really what you want, what you feel like you need. And we get so full of ourselves that we have no room to hear him. We're just coming to, I want to hear something that's good for me. What if it's God saying, I want you to hear what I think is good for you? And we get so full of ourselves that all we hear is other things and what the world is telling us that we should hear. And it's not that he's not talking. It's that we're not hearing what he's trying to say. It's not that he's not speaking. It's not that he's not talking. We're just not hearing what he's saying. And we live a busy and loud life when he's speaking right to us, and sometimes we can't even hear him. 
And sometimes maybe because of this, we find prayer to be maybe mundane, a little boring, a little bit like that's not our thing, that's somebody else in the church's thing to do. Um, we don't really like that. It's ineffective or if we prayed before and felt like we got no answer. We've been there before. We feel like we're hitting a ceiling or that our prayers aren't going anywhere. Or it just makes us kind of tired and sleepy like the disciples. They fell asleep on Jesus while he was praying, right? Have you felt like your prayers ever been hollow, bouncing off the walls as you're in your room trying to speak to God? You're not really understanding, like, why isn't God listening to me? And trust me, I get it. I worked at a church in Colorado. I was super young. I started, I was like 18 or 19 years old. And we had prayer every single morning from like 8 to 9 a.m. as staff. It was amazing, beautiful experience. And I would go in and everyone would kind of be like in the sanctuary like this. Everyone spread out in their own little areas. And you kneel down and you start praying. And you pray for a while. And then at the, the end, we kind of come together. And so I kneel down, I start praying. Thank you, God, for everything. You, you go down the whole list of all your family members and everything and for your work and all your friends. And you thank you for your health. And you kind of get through the end of the list. And then all of a sudden, you start thinking about what you want to eat for lunch. And you start thinking about what you're going to do for work and your task list and what you're going to do the next day and who you should text after prayer is over so you can coordinate going to the movies and going to lunch later and all those things. And you're like, oh, wait, sorry, God. Yeah. It's like prayer ADD. Anyone got that? You're like, wait, God, let me get back on track. <laughs> and you pray again. You're like, okay, God, um, help this. Thank you for the church. Thank you for my pastors. And you get in a good groove. And then all of a sudden, you're like, oh, like, what am I going to do uh, next week? I think I'm going to go to Universal or something with my friends. And then I'm going to do that. And then you're like, oh, God, God, sorry. I'm so sorry, God. And we get so distracted, right? Anyone else have that? Or is it just me? Yeah, okay. Sometimes I still do, to be really honest with you. <laughs> it happens. But that's one of the enemies. Is his strategy is to attack your prayer life. He hates prayer so much, which is possibly why sometimes we pray so little. Think about it. How much of you actually, and just keep this to yourself, how much of you actually really prayed this week? Like, if you could count it up. And the whole point is, if Satan is keeping you busy, he's winning. You know, like in the movies, what's the first thing they do? And movies and the shows, and you're watching this action show, and the guys are going in to, like, raid a building, and what do they first do? They cut off the power. Right? Put the person in the dark, and then we're going to go and get the person, or we're going to go, you know, do whatever they're supposed to do, rob the place, turn off the power. And that's exactly what the enemy wants to do is cut off your power, cut off your prayer. That is your power source, is your prayer. And that's where you are in the dark. You don't really see the enemy coming. Prayer is your lifeline with God. And if he can cut that off, he's got you right where he wants to be. It doesn't mean he doesn't necessarily even want everything in your life to be terrible because the enemy knows if everything's terrible, you're going to run to God. So he can get you just to enough to the place where everything's okay. You're coasting through life. You're not really needing God. That's genuinely the most dangerous place to be. Because in that place, you become lukewarm. What does, Je what does Jesus say he does with the lukewarm church? He literally spews them out of his mouth. And you begin to live a complacent life, lacking the power of God. You might be reading your Bible. You might be coming to church, but you're missing a key piece, which is prayer. And that's where the Holy Spirit is allowed to manifest in your life and in your relationships. If your communication, let's say, with your best friend, your parents, someone dear to you, your boyfriend or girlfriend, if all of a sudden that was just cut off or your phone just broke, a lot of you would panic, right? Oh, my God, I can't talk to my friends. I can't text my boyfriend. I can't text my girlfriend. I can't reach my mom. Like, you panic. Like, you don't know what to do. Shouldn't it be the same way with Jesus? If the enemy's trying to cut you off from Jesus through your prayers, shouldn't it be the same way? He's trying to put Netflix in your face. That's him cutting off power. He's trying to put your phone and TikTok and Instagram and all these things in your face. He's cutting off your power. And I'm not saying those things are wrong or bad. So the question is, how then do we feel God's presence? How do we feel his voice and hear his voice speaking to us? How do we get to that secret place with him? We have to go back to that very simplicity that Jesus taught. Jesus himself set an example of the power of prayer. In the moments of greatest trial and temptation, he went to pray. 
he withdrew himself, seeking guidance, seeking strength from the Father. In his teachings, he teaches the disciples, pray without ceasing, persistently seek God's presence and provision. And in the Lord's Prayer, he addresses those that like to be seen for attention, but Jesus is telling us to pray in that secret place where it's just between you and him. He desires those moments that he can have with you, not so you can be heard in front of everybody else. And he also says not just to repeat those same things over and over again like the heathens do. Sometimes like it becomes like in this monotone way where it's like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth and heaven give us this day. That's very monotone, right? And Jesus says, don't do it like that. Don't pray like that. You know that I actually pray this prayer almost every single time I pray? Almost every single time. Mostly, obviously, when I'm alone, but not in some religious, repetitive kind of way. It's not to be used like that. And I grew up very much so learning how to pray this way. Um, and this is kind of, I think, maybe sometimes comes across as like a cliche or cheesy way to present things. Um, but I understand the relevance and importance of it. And it's used, actually, the word pray as an acronym. So I'm going to go through the acronym. Some of you may have heard it before. But I want to go through it with you because it really is the Lord's prayer broken down for you that you can use every single day as your guide. So I'm going to go through the first one. P is praise. And I'm going to put it on the screen for you. P is praise. This is the posture of your heart before God. So no, no matter what feelings or emotions or anything that you have in, inside of you, it's worshiping God first, putting him first. The Bible literally says, our Father who art in heaven. This is our Father. Our dear father who is, maybe you don't have a natural father, but he is your father who you can go to, who you can trust, who protects you. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. So you're first recognizing he's your father, and secondly, recognizing you are holy, you are worthy. No matter if my life is terrible right now, you deserve the honor and the glory because you're bigger than this, you're greater than this. I give you honor and praise and glory Sometimes we like to come to the throne of God before giving thanks and just like, God, everything's terrible. And it's not, it was horrible. And we forget the reverence. We forget to give him that place first. Like, no, God, like you are worthy despite what's going on. I'm going to share my stuff with you in a minute. But God first, hallowed be your name, recognizing that he deserves all that honor and glory and praise. The second one is repentance, the R repentance and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us so first we know that we maybe are or were sinners we ask for forgiveness no matter what it is i'm constantly on a daily basis god forgive me if there's anything i said today if there's anything i did today forgive me if there's something that i shouldn't have done forgive me every single day every single day God, forgive us if there's anything even in our heart that we don't even know about that we are doing or we, we don't think correctly about, forgive me. And also, Lord, help me to forgive people around me because Lord knows there's a lot of people around each and every one of us that may hurt you, that may speak things against you. God, I forgive them. Much easier said than done, especially if someone's really hurt you. But that's the, that's the second piece. Always forgiving Unforgiveness, bitterness, hurts, any offense, even impurities and fears and worries that you have, all of those things hinder your prayer. And you have to ask God to forgive you and ask you, him to help you forgive those around you. The third one is A for ask. And you're asking God to give us this day our daily bread. This is asking the Lord for wisdom and guidance. Guidance to speak the words that he wants you to say throughout the day. Guidance to speak to people that he's put in your life or to even just make an act of love to somebody around you that needs that. And this is asking God. This is the bread that your spirit needs to operate throughout the day. And lead us not into temptation. You're asking God, help me not to fall into sin. Help me not to slip up today. Help me to watch my mouth. Help me to speak kindly to the young people around me at school. Help me not to fall into 
jealousy or envy or any of those things, those things come at each and every single one of us every day. Not to be trapped into that. And ask God not only for those things, ask him for boldness. We're just talking about that. Ask for boldness. Boldness to do his will. Asking him to help you. Boldness to be obedient to him. Not the safe prayers of just asking to complete the promises over your life, which are great, but also those bold prayers like, ask God to use you. Literally, ask God to use you. Ask him to help you throughout the day. And one of the most amazing ways that we can ask is by scripture. I'm going to ask if you can put that on the screen. So I was reading a book, and um, a lot of the categories in the book at the end of each one had all of these Bible verses at the end. And I thought it was amazing. I don't know if you guys want to take a picture of that when they, when they put it up. Um, but it talks about your passion, your focus, your identity, your family. These are all things that we deal with. Your past, your fears, which is what we're talking about right now in, in church on Sundays. Pressures that you deal with. That one, that one's good. Hurts. And relationships. These are all amazing areas, and I would encourage you to take these scriptures and use them in your prayer time. Maybe you just want to focus on one a day. Maybe that you're hurting. So open your Bible to Mark 11, 25 and pray that Bible verse. When you pray the scripture, it'll change your prayer life. And many of us also ask for a lot of natural things, material things, which are okay. But our main focus should be to ask for eternal things. Ask the Lord for the salvation of your family. Ask the Lord for the salvation of your friends. Ask the Lord for the salvation of your parents, your, your grandchildren, your, your kids. Ask the Lord for salvation for your cousins, anyone around you that you know. Those are eternal things that you might ask for for years. But I'm going to hit that later on the consistency. And then why? The why of the pray, not why do we, the why of pray, is yield. And yield is really yielding like you do on the streets when you're driving and you yield and you kind of kind of like stop for a second. It's like giving that moment to God like your kingdom come, your will be done, whatever direction you need me to go in today, on earth as it is in heaven. Yielding to his kingdom, not your kingdom. It's asking the Lord for his kingdom to reign in your heart, in and through you, as you go throughout each of your days. This can apply to everything, at work, at school, at home with your friends, praying that in our government, in every single area, that his kingdom would come, and not our own. And the last part is, for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So that yielding part is just always closing and finishing with honoring him, that his kingdom is above all. He is glorious above all. He is powerful above all. So P is praise. I'm going to recap real quick. P is praise. This is opening the door for you, the connection between you and God. R is repentance. That's where you're literally emptying yourself at his feet. Empty yourself. A is ask. Ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's hard to be filled with something when you're still full of something else. So you got to empty yourself first and then be filled up. And then last is yielding. So you're full of the Holy Spirit. Now it's like, all right, God, I surrender. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to speak to? What Bible verse do you want me to share today? The prayer has the power to transform you, to heal your wounds, to mend any brokenness, to renew your spirit. And we find strength to life challenges, and courage to overcome fear, and grace to forgive those that have wronged us through prayer. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus for you. And this also goes back to the Bible verse I opened up with at the very beginning, Ephesians 6, 18, pray in the spirit at all times, on every occasion, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for believers everywhere. Touch this really quick. Jesus prayed consistently. The Gospels in the New Testament have examples of Jesus praying all over the place for sick people, 
for miracles, for food in the garden when he went to retreat and pray on his own, and even on the cross. Even on the cross. I don't know about you, but I, that's, that like blows me away. And we need to do the same thing. Consistently pray. The frequency of your prayers is an indicator of your dependence on God. I'm going to say that one more time. The frequency of your prayers is an indicator of your dependency on God or the lack of. If you don't pray, you're saying basically, God, at this point in time, I'm pretty good. I don't really need you. And that's where you start to become lukewarm. And trust me, prayer can be, like Jesus said, so simple. Pray when you wake up. It doesn't got to be for an hour. Pray as you're getting ready. Pray in the car. That's like my number one place to do it. Pray in the car. Pray in between classes at school. You get out of class, you're walking, you're not talking to anybody. Pray in between classes. Pray at lunch. Pray in your meetings before work. I'm very blessed to work in a Christian organization at a school, and every meeting we, we open with prayer. And it's not those like, oh, Lord, thank you so much. Bless you for this prayer. It's literally sometimes we pray with our eyes open. God bless this meeting. Thank you for everything you're going to do. I thank you that you're going to speak it through in, in, in us in the name of Jesus. Amen. That quick and that simple. But recognizing in every moment, everywhere that you can, to pray. And go before a conversation with somebody that you know you might need to have, pray first. You learn about that in Nehemiah. And most importantly, listen. Sometimes we just need to stop talking and listen to God. Listen to his voice. And if you struggle with that, ask God, help me to hear your voice. Help me to recognize how to hear your voice and how you speak to me. Because I believe that God speaks to each and every one of us individually in our own ways. And sometimes we may hear very similarly, but I believe that God knows you very intricately and he speaks to you in ways that may be different than me or different than anybody else. The next one is Jesus prayed often. So this was a regular thing. We're to imitate him. And if he prayed as much as he did being the son of God, how much more are we to pray as humans? And Jesus prayed passionately. Like he said, it wasn't this monotonous, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm actually really curious like, I want to go to heaven and ask God, like, okay, Jesus, how did you tell the disciples about the Lord's Prayer? I just want to know how you said it. Because I want to know, like, how much passion did he actually have behind it? How did he explain it? Jesus prayed in public, but he also prayed in private, in that secret place. And yes, we can pray in public, and that's good. And some of us here probably pray quite a bit in public, more than we even do at home. And some of us might, it might be easy to even pray in public or around friends or people or with a microphone, and then you get home and you don't even know what to say. And that's the one that Jesus said, be careful because I never knew you. You say all of these things in my name, but I don't know who you are. And Jesus clearly teaches that the most important place to pray is with him alone. He already knows what, what we need. He really just wants to spend time with us with our Father. And this is how we grow in our relationship with him, how we build ourselves, and how we become more like him. You ever realize the more you spend time with somebody, the more you start acting like them? The more you start talking like them, the more you start joking around with them? Well, the more you spend time with Jesus, the more you'll start acting holy. The more you spend time with Jesus, you'll stop cursing. The more you spend time with Jesus, you'll stop sleeping around. The more you spend time with Jesus, you'll stop looking at pornography. The more you spend time with Jesus, you'll stop smoking. Because he didn't do any of those things. And if you're spending time with somebody that you want to be like, you're going to start acting like them. Are you going to be perfect? No. But the more you spend time with somebody, the more you're going to be like them. And I've learned the more you want to be with somebody, that desperation, that's going to lead to revelation. If you're desperate for God, if you're desperate to hear from him, you will have revelation from him. My question is, how desperate for him are you? Do you lift your hands and worship? Do you run to the altar when a call is made that really touches your heart? Or do you kind of just stand there unmoved? 
How often do you give up on God right before he's about to answer one of your prayers? Sometimes Jesus just, the guys just like, just keep going. Like, keep pushing. What are you desperate for? And what are you praying for desperately? Some of the greatest prayers that you can pray sometimes don't even have words. I don't know if you've been there before or not. But some of the greatest prayers that you can pray have no words, have no language. Sometimes you're just crying. Sometimes you're just sitting there in silence. Like, I don't even know what to say, but I know that you know that what I need. And I'm just going to sit here. And it's okay to cry, especially in your secret place. Like, that is where you can be real, 100, 1,000% real, where you can cry, and God knows what your cries mean. It's just like a mother or a father with their baby when they're crying. They know exactly what it means. You might hear it in church, and you're like, oh, my gosh, that's annoying. And then the parent knows immediately what it is. They might be hurting. They might not feel well. They might need a diaper change. God knows our cries, too. And he knows. Sometimes you just go to his throne. But let God hear you. Let him hear your cries, even if you don't have words. And let let him give you that revelation that you need. Prayers about intimacy with a person named Jesus, not just about answering a petition for you. It's not just about speaking, but it's also about listening. It's in the silence of our prayer that sometimes we find those answers, that guidance, that wisdom that's beyond our understanding, and this all happens in that secret place. And in honesty, we need to make that secret place a routine. A lot of times you guys hear, how many of you like routines? Like you like to wake up at a certain time, you go to work, you go to the gym, you eat your lunch at a certain time, you eat the same thing on this day, you wear the same clothes if you're in a job on this day, and then on the next day you wear this set of clothes because that's your uniform for that day. Who likes routines? Some. I like routines. (laughs) But sometimes we see routine as a negative thing. We say things like, we don't want to just go through the motions of blank out of routine, and then lose the passion for it. How many of you have said that? Like, I don't want to just go through the motions of going to the gym and doing the same thing all the time, because then I'm going to lose the passion for it. I don't want to just go through the motions of going to church all the time, because if I go too much, then I might just lose passion for it. Or I don't want to go through the motions of worshiping or praying or reading my Bible, like, at the same time every day, because I might lose passion for it. But then you miss one day, and nothing is, and then you miss another day, and you're kind of off your routine. But we put a negative connotation to that word routine. Because routines, they move you to do things when you don't feel like doing it, even though you know it's good for you. So you do a routine, you, it's good for you. It's like taking a shower. Everybody better be taking a shower <laughs> and a routine. You don't have a choice. Cleaning, you got to clean at some point. Getting up for work. Eating your lunch, maybe not be the same time every day, but everybody eats. You don't starve. I don't see anybody starving in here. Um, There's always routines that we do, and that's called discipline. Having a routine and doing it in order is discipline. I can tell you my grandmother and my parents were like disciplined prayer people. My grandma was an amazing prayer warrior. She, you know, in the one place that I saw her praying the most was in her office kneel down in the chair, most of the time like in her little bathrobe, and just praying and crying out to God. And she would sometimes tell me and get frustrated as she got older before she passed away. She would get frustrated because the medicine that she was taking and things like that, if she didn't cry during her prayer time, she didn't feel like it was effective for her. She wasn't crying about one of her grandchildren, somebody that she knew that was hurting or lost in her neighborhood. If she wasn't in that prayer moment with with Jesus, discipline and and crying out to God, she was like, that's not effective for me. And I'm not saying that's the same for you, but find out what works for you in your routine. Same with my parents. My mom's the same way. My dad's the same way. He gets up. My dad's a man of routine, like strict routine. Wakes up at like 5 a.m. every day. I can hear him when I stay in their house. I can hear him walking around on the floor because I stay in the basement. And he's praying, reading the Bible every single day, even on vacation. I'm like, Dad, you could wake up at like 7 and pray later. But that's his routine. And that's what works for him. And I don't remember a day that I didn't, that didn't go by that I didn't know that they weren't doing this. 
And I can tell you it's great and amazing, and I'm so blessed to have those examples in my life, but it's also a choice that you have to make, that I had to make for myself. It's a choice and a routine of the discipline that you decide. What are you going to decide out of routine for yourself? My parents could teach me all day long, every day growing up, but until I did it for myself, it didn't mean anything. Their example was powerful, yes, and I believe that it's the power of my grandmother's prayers, my grandparents' prayers, my parents' prayers that I'm even here today. But if I didn't make the same choice, I wouldn't be here. I can't live off, and we can't live off anybody else's anointing. So don't expect that you grew up in a Christian household and your parents bring you to church all the time. If you don't have your own personal prayer life with God, you're not making it to heaven just because your parents are. You're not living off of their anointing. Discipline is worth more than any momentary motivation you can get from someone hyping you up to do something, and then you're going to stop as soon as that hype is gone and you lose your motivation. So camp is coming up really soon, and I can probably guarantee you, yes, I know we're very excited, woo! But I can probably guarantee you that some of you may have lost your motivation you got from last year's camp, being hyped up, God changed my life, doing all these things. You start a routine, and now it's not the same, or it's gone. And a lot of times that happens. And you just got to realize when that's starting to happen, push back into your routine. Push back into your discipline. A strong prayer life requires that discipline. It requires you to implement a routine to keep you doing what's necessary, even if you don't feel like doing it, but you know that it's necessary for a healthy relationship with God. So create a routine and commit yourself to it. Even if it's different times, different days, put it in your calendar, put it in your phone, but make a routine for yourself. And some of you, you might have a routine, and it's kind of like I learned from my husband who loves working out, that if you do the same workouts all the time, you are going to like go like, you know, stagnant, like kind of plateau, the right word. And um, you got to change up your routine. So it's not that you're not working out, you're just changing it up. So some of you might have a prayer routine, but you're feeling a little stagnant. You're like, oh, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know if I really want to pray. Change your routine. Change it up. Change the times that you pray or the times that you have. Go to a, even a different place or a different room in your house. But I'm telling you from experience that prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. I can't tell you how many times and even the simplest ways and even the funniest ways that it works. Prayer works. And God wants you to have those bold and powerful prayers like the experience I had in India where I know without a shadow of a doubt that that prayer worked because of the Holy Spirit, not because of me. But I allowed the Holy Spirit to work. But also, God wants to meet you in, in the, the littlest stuff. And some of the things that I think, like in your own relationship, God wants to meet you there. And I'll share with you real quick, closing here, that God wants to speak to you in some of like the most funny ways, but so that you know that he, you know that he knows that you know that you hear him. I don't know if that makes sense. So sometime, this is a couple years ago, a few years back, and I was walking at work, and I was outside, and no one was around. There was a piece of trash over there near the playground, and I just kept walking. And I got, like, close to the door, and I knew I was like, I should pick it up. This is really petty, I know. I was like, I should pick it up. And I just felt like that. This sounds really funny, but I felt like that burning in my spirit, like, you know, the Holy Spirit's like, your heart's pounding because you need to go to the front of the altar. I'm by myself at work outside, okay? This sounds crazy. And I'm like, oh, the Holy Spirit is really telling me to pick up a piece of trash. So I walk back, and I, as soon as I pick it up and I'm walking it to the, to the garbage, I just felt like this, like, joy from the, whole, like, the Holy Spirit, but, like, knowing that God was like, I see you even if nobody else sees you. And I know that you just be obedient in the little stuff. God will entrust you with so many bigger things. And still to this day, I walk around work, and sometimes outside, and I see trash, and I'm like, all right, God, I got it. I got it. I got it. And I kind of like, you have that laugh. Like, I just laugh with God. It's almost like you, you picture in your head that God's like smiling or laughing at you, even though you can't really like, yeah. Anyways, 
but I laugh. But those are those simple things that God is like, I want to meet you there in the funniest way or in the, the weirdest way when you know it's literally only you and him. Because there's so many times where I'm like, I just pick up trash and I'm like, nobody sees this, nobody gonna care. Like the people that clean will pick it up. And God's not the point. God's just wanting to know, are you willing? Are you gonna be obedient? Will you spend time with me?